Welcome to Hermit Woods, where there's a story in every bottle. that set up like a, there we go there's no like reverb yeah no unless you set it up that way better now but we're talking about wine today not oh we are the time space okay. uh equilibrium or whatever we're talking about do. sellers we're we? talking about well yes but that is about wine isn't it so uh so yes let me go through, just go through the basics again before we get into it but uh we have a we have a fun topic today that i'm i'm excited about talking about this has uh, been, a, been a fun ride learning about this topic for me um, but before we do that, if you're new to the show, you're just tuning in for the very first time, we'd love it if you would subscribe right below here. I got it right that time. Uh, if you're in YouTube and if you're in Facebook, there's a little bell, click the bell. And if you subscribe to Facebook or YouTube, every time we go live, you'll get a notice that we're going live. And uh, we go live every Monday, uh, 52 weeks a year, as well as some random times on the, oh, on those the are fun. Penobscot Bay or on the ice in Meredith on or on a bicycle riding down three. the road built for three. Yeah. So it might be fun. Uh, so that's how you subscribe to our channel. And if you're joining us, please say something, say hello, uh, put your name in the comments so that, uh, so we know you're here and we can say hello back. If you I have a here. And Matt's here. here, yes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're here yeah. twice. Yes, yeah. that's true. And we do have um, our, our usuals. Chuck has joined us from New York City. Priscilla's hey, on. Hey, Chuck, cheers. Hey, Chuck. Yeah, he gets a little reminder on his, on his watch. Yeah, uh, yeah, he gets a little, right, because he, he pushed the little subscribe. bell. And Christine is here. Matt and Lynn, of course. Janice has joined us again. Travis has joined us as well. Cheers, Travis. Congratulations on the new baby. Travis, cheers. Our chef just had a new baby on Friday. I haven't heard any news, I, I, I'm hoping everything went the, great. Uh, there is a baby. There's a baby, that's, that's <laughs> good, that's good news. Um, the other uh, reigning comment from the crowd is nice haircut, Bob, from <laughs> it's several about people. about time, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I finally come in out of the woods. Um, so, uh, so please, if you have any questions today, we really love to interact with our audience, so uh, pop your questions in there. Marika is gonna be paying attention to them and doing her best to answer them either directly or bringing them to the, to the conversation if need be. And uh, if you like what we're doing, please like the broadcast, share it on your page with your friends and family if you think there are others that would appreciate what we're having to talk about today. And, uh, and remember, we, we're back here every day at five, every Monday at 5.30, um, talking about wine and everything related to wine. And, uh, and, and we, we talk about our, our restaurant as well and the, and the food. Because all of we that, at the end of the day, comes back have. to wine. I know. Look at that. I love. Yeah. So I'll tell Steph. You know. Oh, make us a. You know, just a nice little nibble board for tonight, and yeah, she whips up this nice gorgeous. Board. Yeah, she's, she's wonderful. She always wow. comes up. She's very creative. She, yeah. But she's an artist, right? She's yeah. got a background in art, and it really is reflected in her in her mm -hmm. board. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about today is sellers. Uh, why Why would you want to have a seller, build a seller, and that? is related to wine, not just any old seller. And because yeah, uh, my house had an any old seller. You have a basement. It, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's just, just a cellar. Yeah. You know, it's downstairs. It's where the furnace is and the hot water tank and all that. Now it's full of wine and racks. So interestingly enough, your cellar is very much like the cellars of old. It, it is a cellar of old. No, well, I know, but <laughs> but uh, the wine cellars of old. Your cellar is, is very, uh, very much like a classic wine cellar. It's underground. 
it's moist. It's, it's what you did before we had modern technology, because when we talk about cellars, we have to talk about not just cellars, but wine fridges and wine cabinets. There are lots of ways in the modern day to store wine, right? Um, we didn't have all those ways 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But when you're encased in the earth, you've got this great capacity to keep the temperature very even and to keep the moisture high. It's a great it's regulator. A perfect place to store things that don't like rapid temperature changes. Yes. Root veggies, wine, all sorts of things do great in that environment. Right. And that worked out fantastic. So we'll talk more about that. Um, interestingly, in, in some cases it works out great, and there are other cases where that situation might not work out as well, and, um, and we can get in a little more detail about that. But I also want to talk about why would you want to start a seller? Um, how would you start a seller? What are some of the things you might think about in order to create a seller? And also, what are some of the things in terms of, you know, if you, so once you've decided it's time to start a seller, what, you know, what wines do you put in it? And how many wines should you put in it? And and uh, what style lots, and what age? Of <laughs> maybe lots of wine. maybe it depends on how much you drink, right? If you if you if you uh, drink like I said, like you, lots, lots of wine. wine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so let's just let's let's get started with. Um, well, I feel like the good instruction is, what are we drinking? That thank you. I feel like that's a, that's yeah, a I, it's good. What are we drinking? And speaking well, of cellars, this, this came out of a cellar, didn't it? Well, actually, it came out of our library. Okay. Which well, which is still would be in a cellar, and it's not actually in a wine that's cellar. That's true. Is that a consideration when you're looking at warehouse space? Have you ever tried to find a most warehouse type buildings don't have? It's absolutely basements. a consideration. We have we it we don't have a basement. We find. have to have a, a, at the very least a temperature controlled space. Yeah. And and because our wines aren't in the cellar for that long or in storage for that long, the humidity issue is not as important. Humidity is an issue if you're talking about years in a cellar. It's much more important if you're talking about years mm -hmm. in a cellar. But if you're talking about a year or two, humidity yeah. takes a much smaller role in the aging of a wine. Well, this has been 10 years. So this came out of our library, and it's 10 years old. Yeah. Laid on its side. It, the temperature has been fairly steady, like you said. Yep. It's a temperature control environment. This has actually moved with us because this was crafted when our winery used to be at your house at in your house. basement. Yep. So it was in your basement for a while. Um, and then you moved. We moved it again. And then we and moved it again after that. And we moved it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's really we moved it a few times. had a few journeys around, around yeah. New Hampshire anyway. <laughs> So what are we drinking? Tell so us about this it. is our 2012 vintage of a wine called Whiteface. And this is, we, we crafted a couple of white wines back in 2012 that were different um, blends of rose hips, peaches, rhubarb, quince, as I was exploring mm, what these familiar. different fruits and veggies would bring to the glass. And this blend, this ultimately led to Lake House White. Mm -hmm. So this was the last year, 2013 was the first year of Lake House White. So this is quince, rhubarb, peaches, and rose hips. These are the four mm -hmm. entities that go into Lake House White. But it wasn't called that yet. It was called White Face. We were um, spending a lot of time in the Belknap Mountains, not too far from here on our mountain bikes. And White Face is one of those mountains over there. I, I believe that's why we... Named it that. We also yeah, had is. a round pond. We had a round pond. Which was a blend also, I think, was without the quince. Yeah, and that's how we came up with Lake House Red, Boat House Blue. We were thinking about places. Well, see, place 2013 names. is when we moved into Meredith on the lake. Right. Lake House. And like, bing, oh, lake theme would be a nice way to name some of these wines. Who's going to think, well, what's white face? What's that all about? But Lake House White, okay. Makes a nice crisp white wine. Yeah. We're on a lake. I'm gonna follow that. Oh, this is ten years old, and I think it's ten, right? Yeah. Yep, ten years old, and and I think it's delicious. I think it's really nice. I'm gonna have some more. I love it. It's really. Uh, yeah, there's only that's um, one of the two, one, two, more two more bottles. You so know what's amazing to me is I'm I'm pretty um, attuned to some of the components that go into this blend. And this is a little bit heavy on the quince for me. And quince has this aromatic component that I describe as opening up a fresh container of tennis balls. And I don't know if you can pick that up in here, but even with my, my clogged nose, I can smell a little bit of fresh tennis balls 
on the uh, on the aroma of this? I don't know. I get a I get such a nice floral fruity character on my nose. It's really it, it's like candy to my nose. It's oh, really right. interesting for as old a wine as it is. It's surprising it's up how bright the, the really, fruity notes are. I'm just so amazed that these wines made without grapes out of local ingredients can be put in a cellar, can be held yeah. up for so long and get better, have the flavors integrate, have everything come together. We'll see how these other ones held sure. up. Sure. These are also old wines, but it's also the color thing. It's got a little, it's become a little darker, but still it's, it's still got it's a still nice a color. color. It's not oxidized. Yeah. I mean, it, there, there's a color change from, from introduction of oxygen there slowly over time. There's a little oxidation but... that's going on and that gives it that, that honeyed, um, burnt sugar yeah. tone to it, that golden hue, yeah. which I think is beautiful. I think it's, it's beautiful. Fantastic. If it goes too far, it'll turn, it'll start to have some brownish, yeah, brownish hint to it. And yeah. then, you know, it's, it's moved past it's, it's prime. But, but still, you may get some flavors that come out of that, that although the appearance may not be aesthetically pleasing, the flavors may be what you're all, you know, what you're interested in. And that brings us really to what a cellar is all about. It has to do with time and properly storing a wine or wines for the right amount of time to fit your consumptive goals. And that's, I think that's really the key part, that if, if someone is drinking rosés, fresh wines all the time, the need for a cellar is much less. Actually, perfect. actually, take it a step back even further. 99% of the people on the planet do not have a need for a cellar. We're in a modern day. You go to the supermarket. 95% of all the wine made in the world is made to be consumed within a year or two. That's almost all wines. If you go into a supermarket, it is, it is the intention of the people in that supermarket that you will buy it and drink it. You will not be wanting to lay down most bottles that you will buy in a supermarket. So 95% of all wines are meant to be bought and drink, drank. And, and for that reason, uh, the majority of people would want to have no part or, ha or need no part of a cellar. And even those people who have an interest in learning about or understanding or consuming wines that have improved with age, Again, the modern world has served us well. We have access to well-aged wines all over the world. Of course, you will have to pay more for those wines if somebody's going to take the time and the care to cellar those wines and to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to take good care of them for many, many years and then uh, transport them to a place where they can be safely sold as a cellared wine. Uh, that's gonna cost you more money. But, so we're having a cellar. So it's you can you can weigh out you know the the pros and cons. That way you can you know very very often you can count on somebody having taken good care of that wine. Although the flip side of that, and this is really interesting, there's also the possibility that it wasn't taken as care of as you oh, as yeah. it should be. Yes. So if you're that's buying right. a wine in a small liquor store somewhere in the middle of New Hampshire that's a 2010. Uh, who's to know whether that wine was stored properly for the last 10 right. years? Maybe it just didn't sell well on somebody's shelf and it sat on a retail shelf at some, some random place with sun shining on it. Yep. We just don't know. So if you're going to buy aged wines, my, my suggestion is you buy from very reputable dealers who have a reputation to stand by and will, will want to make sure they're selling wines that are up to par. You know, both of us really enjoy Garage East. And that system out of Seattle, out of the, the West Coast, John goes to different places around the world and collects unique wines. He curates. And, and, and those wines, some of them show up and they've been stored at the winery for decades. And then he's able to pick up four cases and he sends out an email. I got this 2000 and 2001 Bordeaux. And if you're, you're quick enough, if you want, and you can get a bottle. Yeah. And some of them are not that expensive at all. And they've been stored properly at. Well, the, the key, Chateau, and that's the really key, key, is you're buying from the person who bought from the winery. Mm -hmm. um, John, John is the owner of the business and he travels the world, as you said, yep. and visits these wineries and observes the wine, observes, observes the wine in the cellars. He knows where they're coming from. He knows how they're being stored and he doesn't buy them unless, unless they meet the criteria. Yep. 
and then he ensures once he does buy them that they're transported properly. And uh, you know when you when you get them into your hands. Good, she was able to pull up your garage east order. For a I wanted while. to. Sh I'm sharing the link, but I don't want to share your uh, personal page. <laughs> well, you'd have to log into me anyway, yeah. so just share the yeah. garage east. It's fine. Yeah, you should it's definitely. Good. But but if people out there, if you are interested in unique wines, high quality wines that range in price from fifteen dollars to five thousand dollars, garage east is a fantastic system. I love it. Really? I really love it. I love it because I get to t I get to really uh, dig in on a daily basis to thinking about wine, to learning about wines I've never heard of. I mean, he travels all yeah, over. Different so different grapes, different regions. Yeah. So, so, so really, back to the wine cellar. Uh, most of you uh, will likely have no interest in probably uh, never have a cellar. However, why would you want a cellar? That's to start start thinking about. It's okay. All of this suggests you really don't need one, and it. It does cost a fair amount of money for most people to invest in the in the technology necessary to ensure the safe storage of your wine. And trust me, you really want to be be good at it because if you invest hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars in wine to put in a cellar and you haven't created the proper gets conditions, real and everything gets cooked, you got thousands you of dollars of wine. You're going to go to, go to go to waste, and and that's have, a, just a shame. Um, as you get into this, we have two questions you'll want to answer. Um, Priscilla was wondering. If your cellar has a moldy smell but is dry, can it affect the wine negatively or does the glass protect it? And then Matt is wondering if the temperature or the UV is more important. Uh, um, both temperature and UV are critical. You don't want your wines in the sunlight. And, and humidity. And humidity, I think yes. those are sort of the three. Humidity. Like temperature, light, and humidity, yes. probably the three. Yep. Yeah. yep, temperature, sunlight, and humidity. And change. It's temperature Movement. change. Movement. So if you're in a like if you if your uh, if your cellar is on the tracks next to a to a railroad station, not a good place. Vibration is going to keep your sediment moving. It's not going to allow the sediment to settle, and you want the sediment to settle. So uh, if you're in a situation where you're going to or you're 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 created a wine uh, a fridge or a wine cabinet in a location that's on a second or third floor that has some vibration from people walking around. So vibration is another area. The main ones are humidity, temperature, and sunlight, but, uh, but movement is a, is a variable. And um, the moldy, now I'm trying the, to the moldy issue is you know, something to be taken into consideration because corks are permeable. And they do allow transfer of molecules. And if you're putting it in an area that's, let's say, got a lot of bacteria or mold or something, there is the off chance that you could get bacteria into the wine. Though sometimes but they But in a lot of cellars at wineries, and even in my own cellar, when I used to have a lot of wine down there and make wine down there, I would find these these tapestries of this fungus growing And that's sometimes down desirable. And in some places, okay. that's highly desirable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a couple of pictures yeah, to the comments. Of some of these... They'll have little mushrooms growing off the end of a bottle. They'll get this, this incredible tapestry of, of mold growing. And that actually brings some of the flavors and character to the wine. Absolutely. Some of the old Bordeaux. Yeah, I've Burgundy. been into some, some of the top tier Burgundy wineries in France and been into the cellar. And they are dusty, moldy, cobweb filled water places everywhere not so much water hmm. yeah and i think i think that might be a key and this is something i'd like to research more huh. because I, if i would i would imagine that having excess water like standing water is going to promote a, a moldiness at a level of a whole nother magnitude over just moist air hmm. so i i don't but i don't i don't know yeah. that so i can't really speak to it but uh but, but I think all of those variables are key. The, the, I've been to plenty enough cellars that have mold conditions, and the owners of the cellars are not concerned about the conditions of those wines. Right. So I, I, I think that that's a, a minor concern. I don't think, it's, I don't think uh, mold is a major concern. I went concern. to some old cellars in Provence region in northern Italy a few years ago, and they, were, they had water in, in rivers, at ground surface, and these caves were below, below water the water. Table. And it, there was water dripping through there at all times. There was water everywhere, but there was also airflow through the area. It wasn't just closed off like a cave. 
there was actual air yeah. that would move through and that may work to keep that mold pressure down so i, I we need to up. we need to do, do some more digging on this because i don't we think we can be the these places yeah absolutely and <laughs> and then better understand the mold question because i don't i don't fully understand that issue although i do know lots of sellers in europe that have uh, moldy conditions and, and, and the wine is fine. And the wine is fine. And they're, these are top they tier almost, wineries. They kind of embrace it, and it's it's yeah. a very important thing to them. They're, they're not going to go down there and clean their bottles. Oh, no, no, no. I was, they, they, they yeah, want that. They, yeah, they, they want, they want it. Especially well, they don't want to move them. And that's also that's it's that unique environment to that particular cellar and that particular right. chateau. And I think nowhere really, else is going to have really exactly part that. Of their situation. Yes, of exactly. That particular yeah. Another interesting thing about cellars is um, in in Bordeaux, many of the wines in the Bordeaux region are meant to be cellared for for 20, 30, 40 years. Right. Um, and that would be, you know, only the the, the you know, Bordeaux sells sells wines that are also on the shelf of every supermarket in, in America. So um, but these are the very special uh, uh, reserve wines, state wines that are meant to be aged because Bordeaux is known for, for their well aged wines. And what's fascinating in Bordeaux, every 10 years, their top tier wines are uncorked, tasted, yep. tested to make sure they're, they're going in the right direction, and then recorked with fresh corks. And sometimes they'll, they'll be a, what they call ullage that develops. It's right. A cool word. The wine evaporates. So the first and one so they open that tastes air, good. They'll use that to top off. The rest of it. it's kind of like topping a barrel. Yeah, they'll actually top up the bottles. I want that job. Live. <laughs> yeah, then you do. <laughs> they'll they'll know if you spill a drop. Oh, I know. Glass oh, I know. I know. You might not have that job very long. No, I, I, I wouldn't be good at it either. I'd, I'd want to drink it. We need you here anyway. Yeah. So, uh, um, so another question that Matt brought this up to, and I was something I was wondering because um, I remember watching in the the Psalm into the bottle. They were talking about the sellers a lot, and they did have a shot of somebody going through and rotating bottles all the time. And so, I don't know that's if that's a seller that is something that's as far as I understand that's lesser. that's champagne. Oh, okay. It could so have been a, you have to what, it's called riddling, mm -hmm. and champagne you want to move the the yeast right. you on a regular that's, basis. That's different though. I think Marika brings up a good point here. Bob, you're slow. Yeah, He's, he's I'm enjoying. He's yeah. Enjoying. Yeah. It's, all right. it's here for you when we'll, you're ready. We'll enjoy the new one. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a bottle over time, sediment develops. And sometimes, like with champagne, you've added some sugar and corked it or capped it. And that sugar is consumed by the yeast and it creates the carbonation, the champagne bubbles. The yeast dies, and then the yeast goes through a process called autolysis, where it degrades. And as that yeast degrades, it actually creates mouthfeel and texture. That's done in sort of more conventional winemaking, a sur leave process is kept on the leaves, on that dead yeast. <coughs> Excuse me. So in Champagne, they have a minimum of one year or three years or five years for the Grand Cru. It needs to stay on that dead yeast. And so they'll go and they'll turn them to to stir to that up and get better mouthfeel the riddling process is just prior to disgorging that and then to get them capping upside it. down they tip it upside down so they they turn them over a period of 20 some odd days and force all of that yeast down into the neck and then they freeze that neck or chill it right. down and they actually open it and they oh, shoot right. out that thing of yeast yep. they top it up put a crown cap on it or put the uh the cork and wire cage on it, and then it's ready for sale. But I think other wines, they do, they will turn them, but I don't know what the purpose of that is because there's no yeast in there. And what settles are tannins mm -hmm. and other things that develop over time in the bottle. And most of, but, the, what, most of what I read is the, the goal of the seller is to make sure that stuff settles and stays, and settled. stays, settled. stays on the bottle. And, and, and the evidence when I went through Burgundy and there were sellers that had thousands of bottles lined up on the wall, them. they couldn't. The way they were stored, you couldn't touch them. Yeah, they were stacked bottle on bottle. They're bottle on bottle and it's you, amazing the glass you can't touch before. them because they don't want to. There may be, uh, there may be a style of wine, mm -hmm. there may be a variety of wine that, that is somehow looking to gain something from the sediment. I don't, I've never yeah, heard of that. I don't, and I don't remember the context of, 
that shot. I yeah. just remember so, that. So we have a new wine. Again, we'll have to explore that. So let's talk about the new wine before we go on any further. What do we got here? This is not a new wine. This is a very old wine. Very old. This is back to, I think we need to share this with our, our live audience too. We will. This is a 2012. So this, this was one of the most eye-opening experiences for me as a winemaker. I had made a wine out of meat, out of honey, called our three honey wine. And I'd also made a wine out of blueberries called Petit Bleu. And I thought to myself, well, you know, people make blends. Let's see if there's, we could blend it. And so I started blending. And I went through this process of putting a little bit of this and a little more of that. And, and I got to a point where 47% Petit Bleu with 53% of three honey was a perfect blend. And 10 years of age in and the cellar. It was, but it was a mind boggling process to me because I came in the next day and did 46, 54 and changed the ratio and it wasn't quite right. And we've talked so a lot about that. when I saw early on when we were studying wines and getting into this and I would see some blend out of Provence and they have, you know, 18 of this and 30 of that and, 1% Senso or something like that. They're just ditching wine in that. There can't possibly be a difference. But there mm -hmm. is an actual <laughs> difference at a very small amount when you when you blend wine. Yeah. So the blue mead is what we call this blueberry honey mixture, was just for me developing as a winemaker was was one of those occurrences that just blew my mind. And I have to say I think this has held up. Really, really nicely. It's brilliant. And <laughs> if, if there's any reason to have a cellar, like <laughs> these are the reasons. Uh, both of these wines for me are improvements on the original wine yep. and and may continue to improve. This blue meat I still think has room for, for time. There's still there's such a fruit on the nose and it's got it's just got a nice soft flavor to it. The, the flavors are very melded. Um, there's something age brings to a wine that you still can't get I any mean, other way. I know. There's, there's nuance. There's there's, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, it comes with age. And there's lots of people working to try to speed that up. Yeah, well, that's that's just science. I think we just need to lay wines down and, and drink them all. <laughs> so, what year, the, what was the white? 20, 12. 2012 also. Yeah, yeah that was 12. So, uh, Matt asks for this, was it a unique honey? It was a wildflower honey, I think. Just a wild, This wildflower. is the three honey wine. This was the uh, uh, wildflower. Yeah, this is our 2012. I think I made this in 2011 as a blend of the two. Then in 2012, I actually co-fermented the blueberries with the honey. So we had a few of the blue meads that have aged in our cellar, and and some of them have held up really nice, and some haven't. Well, I had some problems, and I think it was 2013. I have a stain on my ceiling at home. Oh, <laughs> from one where I bottled it too Burst soon, a few. and it was still fermenting, it's still doing something. And then when I went to open it, it shot the cork out and shot wine at my ceiling. It's a <laughs> ceiling that's got purple stain on it but so, so it goes. these are these are great examples again of why one would want a seller so let's think about that for a second um, so I think I think generally there's two reasons to have a seller for most people one would be more or less as a hobby to support your your interest of mm -hmm. wine and learning about and growing your interest in wine and the other reason is quite frankly an investment um, there are there are lots of people who have the resources and want to spend their investment money rather than buying stocks and rather and, and futures they don't even and buying property. They just buy, uh, they buy the right vintages of Bordeaux. They lay them down for 10 years and they turn a $200 Bordeaux into a $2,000 Bordeaux, right. or in some cases, a $200 Bordeaux into a five or $6,000 Bordeaux. Yeah. So there are truly people that do this for an investment. I could never be one of those people. I enjoy wine too much. I want to drink the wine. So well, see, you know, going back to garage East, the only reason that this works really well for me is I can buy a well-aged wine. Because right. for me to age wine is almost it's impossible. Only, it's impossible. I don't need an excuse. It's a special day right now. Right. Every day is a special day to drink oh, a wine. Oh, hi, Maya. I saw you this morning. I'll see you tonight. Let me go see if I've got something special downstairs. So, so that actually so it disappears. That actually brings you're, another. You're pretty good at savings. I, I am. And that, uh, I'm a New England. I'm a, miser, a, a Yankee. I'm a, a Yankee miser. But that brings to another point in celery. If you're going to cellar your wine, um, so many people, especially who are new to cellaring, get buy wines in special places in their travels, and and they're they're buy and they spend a little extra money on special wines, 
and they put them in the cellar and they want to save them for a special occasion. And so many times I've seen, I've met people at the tasting bar who said, oh no, we've been saving this wine for 25 years and that wine might be good for 10. They went too far. They went too far. So you, you, that's the worst thing to do is, you know, put wines away and try and, and save them for the special occasion. Have a plan. You have to have a plan. If you're going to age wines, you need to know what your, what your plan is. What wines are you buying and how long are you intending for them to lay up in your cellar? And when you get to that point, and make sure you record that data in the cellar so you know which ones are coming of age and you drink them. And don't wait for a special occasion. Follow Ken's advice. When Bob drink. comes over to dinner, open them. <laughs> right. When Bob comes over. Yeah, no. When, no. when I go to your house, I like to go down to your cellar. Well, we send you down there. Yeah, right. So that is. Uh, so t- let's talk about that too, because like you opened up talking about, you go to a supermarket mm-hmm. and you buy wine. Those wines are not appropriate to be put into a cellar. No, they're designed to be consumed. So you need to reach out and find those bottles from an advisor that gives you a target, and then you need to know about that target and write that down. That this wine, you buy this wine. You should drink it between 2030 and 2035. And then you need to drink it then, because if you wait to 2040, it's not going to be good. And if you drink it in 2025, it hasn't reached its peak yet. So having a little bit of organization, I think, makes the cellaring process that much more rewarding. That's It is. I have tags. I'm, I'm not good at it, actually. I, you I'm, have some I'm, tags. Where you I have some. I've got good at it in some ways, but in other ways not. But um, you can tag the wine. You put a little hang a little tag. And I usually put the year that I bought it. I put the the, uh, the drinkability, the ages that are recommended by the, who I bought it from. Usually Gargis, not usually, always Gargis writes the drinkability ages. Um, we do that on our wines as yeah. well. You got a bunch from Gordon too. One yep. time early on. And I, yep, and I and I also record how much I paid for it because I have actually uh, taken wines that I've paid 20 or $30 for you know, 10 or 12 years ago and are worth a few hundred dollars. So th- those wines do age in not only the quality of the wine, but but to replace that wine today would cost me a lot more money. So it's an investment for me as well. Can I come drink those? You, you have I drank them. <laughs> you have many of them. There are more. Yeah, there's more. Of course, there's more. Okay. There's always more. Okay. And it's yeah. it's always changing. So th- <laughs> that's the uh, that that's the other thing to to think about. So before we get too deep into the in what wines we're going to put in the cellar, let's talk about the various options. You can. You can have a cellar basement like like Ken's, which which uh, it, because it's an old New England basin, it's underground. There's lots of moisture, the high humidity, so you're looking for a humidity of fifty to seventy percent. That's the range. Minus ninety. You're yeah, 90. yeah. So you've got mold. Um, so so yeah, fifty to seventy percent. You're looking for a temperature of fifty to sixty degrees. Um, you can go a little warmer, and you can go a little colder. As long as it goes. Slow, as long as it's right? steady. Yep. Yeah, and so the, the downside with yours, if you start using your furnace too much, which I know you heat with wood, so it's not as an, an issue for yeah. you. But if you started using your furnace every day, then you would be changing the temperature of your basement more regularly. You would be changing that. You'd be drying it out. This time of year we do. Yeah. So, but so that's something nice. to be, you have so much moisture and airflow in your basement that no matter what you do with your, your, yeah. your furnace, you're not going to worry about it. I actually have it. a device down there that tells me the, the conditions. And right now, the climate in my kitchen, it's 63 degrees in my kitchen Fahrenheit and 42 degrees humidity. But in my basement, it's 47 degrees Fahrenheit and 90% humidity. Perfect. I need to get one of those. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, yeah, because I bet, I think where we have our wine stored is probably not right. It's yeah. the case with most people. Yeah. It's not easy. It's probably, I think it's an inconsistent temperature. I don't know what the humidity is. It's just down in Steve's office, which is sort of a half level. And the humidity is changing with the season. That's how yeah. it's going to change, and you're okay for a few years. I mean, you That's keep true. in yeah. mind if you're if you're turning your wines yeah, over every couple of years. Trajectory again, the timing. The the where these things really become critical is five to ten years. Mm-hmm. You're, then you start to worry about it. Um, one to two years, if you're turning those wines over, you're going to be fine. I mean, you still don't. You still want to be careful. Yeah. Because yeah, so you could risk damaging the wine, but the the damage that's going to occur in one to two years in that situation will be really minor, if any. Um, but. Uh, so you can you can uh, an old New England cellar that doesn't have a furnace that's running all to- all the time in the winter is perfect. 
if you have a cellar that is perfect conditions, but every winter you fire up your furnace and your cellar warms up, that's not so perfect. You've got to right. you've got to segment off a portion of it that doesn't get exposure and to the heat. That's easy to do. It's yeah, two by it's easy to do. Insulation. And, yep. and you're set. Not hard at all. Um, the uh, you did that at your old house. Yep. You got that little sheet of plastic and that tucked up area that we crawled yeah. up into. Yeah. Yeah. And, that was and had, it had the earth exposed, yeah, so lots of moisture. Yeah. Um, you can get uh, wine refrigerators. Those are ideal, but you've got to really maintain, your, you know, if your power goes out, that changes things very rapidly. But wine refrigerators are ideal for, for maintaining humidity and temperature. And then there's wine cabinets, which are basically a variation on a refrigerator. They're just larger and can hold 100, 200 bottles of wine, 300 bottles of wine. And, um, and they're not that outrageous, but they're a little bit more of an investment, a couple thousand dollars for a wine cabinet. And then the, the ultimate, if you have the resources, uh, you can actually build a room in your basement that is that is designed and built to be a right, winery. Right. It's insulated. It's uh, to be a wine cellar. It's insulated. It has a, a humidifying system in it. It has a temperature control system in it. And you can nail, you can dial it in and nail it. And you have a system on your phone, just like Ken does, that says that alarms you if your cellar goes off. Because right. if you've got... Twenty thousand dollars worth of wine in a cellar. That's this is really getting at that. That's point. really so if you're, top if you're tier. You're going to have a few thousand dollars worth of wine that you're investing in. Right. And and the cool thing about it is you 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 buy you let's say you consume a hundred bottles of wine a year, so you buy a hundred bottles of wine every year, but you're not consuming those hundred bottles that you buy. Those go down in your cellar. You're consuming those wines that you bought five years ago, ten years ago, and fifteen years ago. That are reaching their peak. So that's, that's what you're consuming. And so it doesn't, it's not that expensive once you get set up and you get into that mindset. And then you get to consume really nicely, properly aged wines all the time it's, at, a, at a very reasonable price. And wines that you've personally selected. That's the other thing. You, right. you, you spent time researching yeah. and gaining this collection. So you know, if you don't have a cellar, you have to go to the supermarket and hope and pray you can find something that's good. And right. sometimes it's a bit of a gamble. It's, it, in fact, every time you go to the supermarket, it's a gamble because the wines are turning over all the time. You, you, you really, you just don't have a lot of information. If you go to a wine shop where you have somebody who's tasted yeah, those wines and they're too. knowledgeable, right. not, a, not as much of a problem. You say, look, I want a, a Provence red. This sort of character. But if you're buying it for the meal that night or the meal that you're going to have that week or the guests expensive. that are coming over on the weekend, it'll probably be expensive. And even if it's not, you have to spend the time and the research to gain that knowledge, to get that bottle, to have that dinner party. Right. Whereas if you're working ahead of the game and you're storing wines in your cellar, you don't have to worry about it. You already know. Every dinner party you have for the next six months, you are well you're stocked for. You've got a plan for. You know what well, style. For the rest of your life. As yeah. Long as, as long as you can afford to buy those. those keep the rotation going. And you keep that rotation going. It just takes a little bit of organization, a little bit of effort to set it up. And again, it gets back to, you know, how much wine do you consume that you want to have a special bottle of wine? You know. So maybe, this is. Maybe it's 50 bottles a year this or whatever. Is, then, you, then you scope out the shape and size of your cellar. If you're always drinking $20 bottles of wine, then it's probably not appropriate to spend $10,000 on your wine cellar because it doesn't warrant that. But um, if you're going to have these $20 bottles of wine that you want to put five years on, then maybe you spend a couple hundred bucks on some insulation and a little right. setup. And, and, and one, I, I read a nice article earlier that was, uh, uh, they, they sort of gave, suggested this concept of thinking about your, your drinking strategy for the next six months or a year and set up a cellar for six months of a year and see if you can see how it works. See how you go through oh, before it. Before you jump all the way in. Before you go all the way in, yeah. Uh, so see what your pattern is like. Sure. Get used, like teach sure. yourself to be in a in a cellar pattern. And I tried doing that. Yeah. And I spent so much money and drank so much wine over six months, I knew I couldn't afford it possibly. So you just that. didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I go to Bond's house, man. He's a Yankee, he doesn't drink his wine, so I go over and I help him. We, we have sort of we have tiers there. on our well we have we have a couple of different racks but the rack that's up in the kitchen is a small one and that's for our sort of sweeter everyday things and ciders sure. are up right. there and mm -hmm. are you know always an heirloom crab apple on hand and things like that and then the larger wine rack down in the office has you know a top shelf of these are you know everyday reds but and then you, have you some know a little more ones. casual and the next one is these are 
every day, but for maybe like a slightly nicer dinner, like a pot roast dinner, not just sure. not your pizza ones. It's yeah. a little so nicer. Actually, and then below that is these are not say forever wines, but like maybe a nice like a date night dinner. And then the bottom shelf are the ones that we're not allowed to touch this for five years or I have. I think three different vintages of Hermitage that we're saving for a sure, while. Yeah. And so you actually so we, we bring, can't touch the bottom shelf. So we've got the You bring the organization. a really great, there's, that's one strategy for building your site. Yeah. And one thing that I should tell everybody, make sure you do, this is really critical. Have a section in your cellar for, as you just said, for your everyday wines. I mean, I don't know about you guys. I can't afford to drink 30 and $40 wines every day. I just can't I'll afford it. For you. I'm sure you would. You keep on. You sure you could drink my 30 and $40 yeah, exactly. wines all day <laughs> no long. No problem. But um, I wouldn't be able to last that long, and then the relationship would be over, and you'd have to move on and find another second wife. So, because <laughs> um, it, it, it's not realistic. So it's 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 good to have yeah. your entry level wines that you have a rotation of. So on a on a random Tuesday, you're having a spaghetti dinner, and there's there's really no occasion. You can pop a bottle and not fear that you're you're digging into your your cellar that you've spent all this money and time taking good it's care. It's also of. important if you're cohabitating or you have a number of people. That yes, it is because. Someone may not know that. They may not know that. They go they down and they, they oh, grab just your hundred dollar Bordeaux mm -hmm. and they just brought it up to have with pizza tonight. Right. And then you're like, wait, wait a what? minute, what are you what? drinking? <laughs> Why did you open that? <laughs> so the other, so that's one way. Tier your cellar based on 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 the, the the qualities of the wines so that you know what you're you're digging into. And then the other thing that that uh, that tier it based on ages. So one example is when I started my cellar, um, and um, and this is really. You know, a lot of people will start a cellar and they'll say they'll buy a few bottles here, put them in there. Just buy another few bottles, put those in there. But they're buying the bottles at about the same rate that they're drinking them. And they're noticing, hmm, my cellar's never filling up. <laughs> I'm buying three bottles and I'm drinking three bottles. I'm buying another oh, three bottles and I'm drinking another three bottles. constantly full. We keep buying new racks and then saying, oh, now we've, now we've got space. And then you have buy wine and you drink wine. Right. As soon as we fill, open up a plan. space, it's exciting because then we get to buy another bottle of wine. Well, that's why, <laughs> that's why you need a plan. Because it, if, you, if you don't have a plan, it can get out of control. If you get out of control, you can end up putting wines away for too long. So you need to know what your seller's doing and, and what the rotation is. I don't know. I kind of like the out of control part. <laughs> mm. Kind of fun. And you shouldn't have a seller. You should just buy the wines you like to drink and drink them, which is what you do. Well, that's what I do with garage. Exactly. So when I bought my seller, I, I saved up a few thousand dollars. I don't remember exactly how much. Maybe it was $4,000. And... And I went to your friend, uh, Gordon, who, who really knows wine well. And, I remember, this was early on. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I asked Gordon, I said, I'm building a cellar. And it's going to be my first cellar, and I want it to have some range. I wanted to, to, to play it out for 20 years. So I said, I fill my cellar with wines that are going to be well, that are going to drink well in five years, 10 years, and 15 years, and 20 years. So four different styles of right, wine right, right, right. and we went around and around and he picked wines that he thought I would like and suggested them and 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 I chose some other ones and suggested those and we went back and forth until he came up with a list of, of, of 10 or 12 cases of wine ranging in prices from $20 a bottle to I think the most was probably 30 or 40 dollars a bottle on the average yeah there were a couple yeah, that might have been I'm okay <laughs> all right you saved the wine, I see. And save lost a few drops. Twisted her ankle. Oh, I'm sorry, Marika. That's all right. This ankle gets twisted a lot. You know, Gordon <laughs> Gordon tells about groups. He's involved with lots of different wines and uh, people that have those multi tens of thousand dollar sellers and they collect. He helps them build them just like he helped me. So they occasionally will get together some friends and the criteria is everybody's got to bring a bottle out of their cellar that hurts Ooh. to take out of their cellar. Mm, I like that. So it's that bottom <laughs> tier. It's that one that you really don't want to open. And that's the only criteria to show up at the tasting. You got to bring a bottle that hurts to open. <laughs> and people bring whatever they, you know, someone it may be a hundred dollar bottle, someone it may be a $10,000 bottle, but in each case that really hurt for that person to bring that bottle. And they all get to partake in those different ones. So the the plan for my cellar was, you know, I, so I had a cellar full of wines, five year, 15, 10, 15 and 20 year wines. You still have and some. And they're tagged, I still have some. Well, it hasn't been, it's only been 12 years. I gotta get working on it. 
So I've got some wines that are still still eight years from, from being at the point when they're going to drink the best. And you know what's interesting is all of these wines that I'm talking about that are, that I say, 20-year wines, they say the drinkability range was from 2012 to 2030. A wide range. You know, it's a wide range. Yeah. So, you know, I go down and I'll read some of these tags on some of my nicer yeah. bottles, yeah. and they say, well, they're in the drinkability range, but I'm going to leave them. And that brings another good point. So if all you buy is one bottle of each variety that you'd like to lay down in your I cellar. I buy these two. Right, because you, yeah. you, if you buy one bottle, you open it and that's it, you're done. You, you, you've opened it. So if you, hit, you miss the mark, um, the best, if you could have the resources of space and money to do it, the best way is if you have key wines that you know, that you have some knowledge about and you know can age, buy a case. Right. And then when you get within the, you know, if you have a wine that has a 15 year one range, year. right? Get into the middle of that range and start drinking, and yeah. you'll 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 really learn about how they change with time, and you'll you'll find out when that wine's going to drink best. And I then, like that there are a lot of wines that we have, you know. Sometimes we don't know. You put out several wines that it says you know drink twenty twenty two to twenty twenty five plus, or you know. Cause well, because we're making an educated guess. Yeah, and there are stuff. some that you know we they keep aging and aging, and they keep doing what well. So did, did we put a drink on this? One that we just opened, which is called. Blue. I doubt it. I don't think we. Because that was we didn't do that in the very beginning. And I, well, I don't think we, we do it now because we don't. Right. We don't it's year. 2011. It's 2011. 2011. First year. So we don't. We don't put years on our wines. We we haven't since 2013 or 2014. So we wouldn't. We definitely wouldn't have years. So this was the precursor to Petit currently. Blue Reserve, and this is 11 years old, and it's still getting better. It's smooth. It's integrated. It's flavorful. I, you know, I, and the Petit Blue Reserve, reserve that I blue? was working on today that I made a few months ago, I would say now it should go 10 or 20 years. Because it may. Yeah. Because I'm building may. them with bigger structure. Yeah. More tannins. So what is, this is, this is what you would say is equivalent to the Petit Blue Reserve. This was the, um, the concept of taking what we were making as Petit Blue, which was a stainless tank only... 100% wild putting in a barrel. wine, and this one I put in the barrel. There's and, 2% um, elderberry, too, in this. About this and there's percent. a little bit of elderberry in this. And that was, again, I was really getting into this blending component of nuancing the characteristics of it. Plus, I probably needed the tank to put something else in. <laughs> there's always practical aspects to, to winemaking, as any. Have you opened bottles of this periodically in oh, the yeah. past 10 years? Yeah, I do have notes, and I'm going to put some notes in tonight on the same for each one of these wines afterwards. But it's still, okay. it's still improving. I think so. Yeah. Think it's so. still got some fruit. It's still got some color. Look at the color. I know. It's, it's ten, hasn't, it hasn't ten year old wine. It's still got some nice brick, purple. Brickish orange that you typically would yeah. get with, with age. That what was the cork you put in this one? This one was the 10 cent cork. This was a, the cheap 10 cent cork. Agglomerated cork. Yeah. This wasn't the super nickel, the super cheap nickel cork that we did <laughs> in our, in the very, our home in the wine making. early stages. Yeah, the early Actually, stage. that's a that's a good question though. What about Closures. for aging wine? Uh, very good, Marika. You know, would you want that's to age a well. wine that is in a screw cap? Mm -hmm. Today, yep. Now as you can. As long as you have the right screw now cap. You can. Now you can. So, thirty years ago, a screw cap was a hermetic seal. It would crank down on the wine and it wouldn't let any oxygen transfer. And if the wine wasn't prepared properly to have that closure, there would be problems. But they were mostly using screw caps on wines that were consumed within months. And so it went fine. And that's part of the uh, resistance to fine wine being under screw cap is because we always think back, screw cap means cheap wine. Mm. But now screw caps have been radically engineered to behave like corks with specific oxygen transfer rates if you want that and they don't have any of the issues that a cork may have as a natural product this could have tainted the wines we could have pulled this cork out it would have looked fine but tca other components could have turned this into a musty wet dog you know plunk it wouldn't have been any good and a screw cap will never do that so screw caps have come a long ways, and there's still, the jury's still out on that, on some of the really 
super decades ageability mm -hmm. wines, but they are doing that in Bordeaux and elsewhere. They're putting wines under screw cap and under cork, same cuvee so going compare. in the bottles and then putting them in a cellar, keeping the conditions the same, and then checking those every five years to see, doing blind tests with experts to see how those are evolving. And I think that the Jerry's is still out. You don't have the the romance that that protocol of, of pulling a cork. You know, you you spend that that money on that bottle of wine. You like to pull that cork out. There's something very special about that. So yeah, going it's click, just, click, it's, click. Yeah. yeah. Although the modern world, younger wine drinkers, let me just open the top. Well, that's 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 open what's it up. That's what's done. working. And, and I, I think it. I think that's going to be the win. Is that that more and more wines are being put under screw cap. And I think probably half the wines in the supermarket these days are screw and cap. And they should be because they're meant they're to be consumed. Better right well, yeah. They're better closure. They're they're better closure, especially for men to be consumed. Yeah. But even for older wines, like we've talked about before, New Zealand has been a, been 100% a over to screw cap for the last few years. Uh, Australia is moving in that direction yep. very rapidly. Yep. And that means, you know, I mean, New Zealand produces some world-class wines and they're putting them under screw cap. Mm -hmm. So the old idea that you uh, that you need to, you need to have a cork and a wine to, to, to buy something that's worth investing an in idea. is an old idea. And also um, the other advantage of a screw cap is, is you have to lay a wine down in the cellar. If a wine has a cork in it, uh, part of, you know, the, the moisture in the air is about keeping that cork moist. So that 50 to 70% humidity that we like is about keeping the cork moist. But also you lay the bottle on its side so that the wine stays up against the cork because you need to keep it moist from that side as well. So, that's, so uh, what happens if you store your Cheval Blanc upright in the basement for 30 years? So what happens if it is a cork? <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> so if it is a great cork, question. Is a great question. <laughs> if it is a cork, the cork can literally dry out, shrink, and crack and allow rapid transfer of oxygen and spoil the wine. Chuck knows this very well because he has quite a few vintage Bordeaux at his house that he shared with us. And... Um, a lot of them have an ullage that where it's gone way past Two or three the inches. shoulders. <laughs> and so the cork is still in it, the wine is still sealed, but it's a 1949 Chateau Margot that would be worth $2,500 and it's ruined because it was left upright and the cork dried. When we take our corks, when we cork our wines, because we're dealing with cases and we need to store them, it's difficult to store them all on their side. We flip them upside down. And this is done the world over with wines that don't have the place to store them on their side, like right. the cave and burgundy. You cork the bottles and then you flip them over and you just leave them upside down. So they're always staying moist. Right. With um, sugarcane based corks or, or screw caps, you don't have to worry about that. You leave them upright and they're fine. Um, we had one question a little bit ago uh, from Priscilla, I think, um, wondering about all these rules, do they apply at all to hard alcohol? It's, no. I generally think you, know, you can open a bottle of whiskey, store it upright under your kitchen sink. A 12 year old for, scotch is a 12 year old scotch. No matter when you open it. No matter when you open it. That's so 12 if you, years in a barrel. And, this is, a, I, I learned this, they discovered Shackleton's storage of, of, of uh, they, whiskey, of scotch. Did they really? They did. Oh, I didn't This was years ago. Uh, it was buried under the cabin that they survived in for a year. They didn't drink it? Uh, no, and and they. Uh, but the guy uh, wasn't on that. It was. It was. I think it was twelve years. Twelve years scotch. But what they what they said is it's still twelve years scotch. It was a hundred years old, but it's still twelve years scotch when you that's open so it up. Because uh, whiskey, once you cork a whiskey into a bottle, it's that's it. It's done. It's, and it's, it it lasts. It doesn't have the same. I don't know what the word is. Volatility, I guess. Well, uh, like once you oxygen. can open a bottle and it drink it. It doesn't have the same relationship with yeah. oxygen. You can open a bottle, drink a third but of it, it and get oxidized, but it, it can change. change from evaporation and losing some of the ethanol sure. that's in there. And that happens that's why once you close the bottle, it's gonna stay the you same. Know, it's forever. interesting about champagne. Up until I think it was about fifteen years ago, uh, very fine champagne. You know, you paid five hundred bucks for a bottle. And um it had been laid on its side and had its lees contact for five years. It was a, you know, a, a, a top tier champagne. And when that was released, that's when you consume it. And no one thought you should ever age it anymore. It's not on the leaves. It's ready to consume. It's done its thing. But people started realizing because they had left some fine champagnes in their cellar, 
way longer than waiting for a have. special occasion. Mm-hmm. Waiting for a special occasion, they're like, oh boy, well that's that's not going to be good. And they found that it has improved in character. So now you can buy aged champagnes. Well, because so really interesting. Ages uh, champagne is a wine, and it's under cork, which is air permeable. So it's interacting with with it's oxygen. Under pressure, though, those corks are much different. There's no because they're oxygen negative transfer. pressure. It's yeah, all it's under you know six bars of pressure. Yeah. So there's no transfer. So there's chemical Something reactions changing that are taking there. place within the liquid that's separate from oxidation, but it's evolving. But as far as I understand, uh, a whiskey or bourbon, right. Those are, forty percent alcohol. Alcohol isn't going to change. Right. And what changes when you talk about aging a twelve-year-old whiskey or a twelve-year-old bourbon? What's what that means is it's been twelve years in a barrel. In the barrel, yeah. Before and they it's bottle been it and sell evaporating, it. and it's been concentrating, and it's been absorbing character from the wood. It's been filtering through the through the charcoal barrel. It's lots of things are changing that during that process. But once it's out of the barrel and into the bottle and corked, that's what it is. It's twelve year wine or or a spirit. Right. Right. Good, good question. question. Yeah. Who, who was that, Priscilla? That was Priscilla, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Priscilla. That was a that was a good good question. Um, so is there anything about celery that we didn't cover? Yeah, so, so we're down to our last, last few minutes. So yes, yeah, you have minutes, sort of a closing yeah. arguments. As it were. Um, yeah. And if there's any additional questions that we don't get to while we're live, as always, we'll try and do our best to answer those so, questions. So with, with corked wines or with properly screw capped wines, um, you know, thinking about storing them with screw caps, you can store them upright. So it changes the makeup of the cellar in Historically, That's right. cellars were all done with wines that had a cork. Right. So all of the racks were Absolutely. designed to hold their wines on the side right. or at some angle to keep the cork moist. And so that's changed now. So you could have a whole new type of cellar with all your bottles upright because they're all your screw cap. When I was looking, past, for, was when I was looking for pictures of some wine cellars, I came across a few where all the wines were, were, were right. vertical. You can yeah, read the labels the yeah. and they, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. That's interesting. I, like that could I know look with, really with nice. some wines that are, you know, aging for decades and they haven't moved, some of the sediment will develop down that lower side. Yeah, you can. I mean, you can see it. You can see on it this there. one. Yeah. yeah. So then, what you do in preparation for your special dinner that night is the day before, you bring that wine out of the cellar and turn it slowly upright, mm-hmm. and leave it upright for a day or two. And any loose sediment that might be poured into the glass will settle to the bottom, down into the punt, and then you can decant that or pour that off carefully into your glasses without catching any sediment. So that's that's interesting. So this one of the reasons that this well, you called it a punt, yeah. it's the indentation on the bottom of your wine bottle. One of the reasons that that's there is it creates a, a trough to that help hold it. helps hold yeah. that that sediment uh, firm. So when you go to pour it, you, you, it's less likely to fall into the wine and, and that sediment. And, you, and it's another interesting point. No matter how much you, you take care to bottle a wine that is clear, if you spend uh, enough change. time, oh, it will develop sediment. That isn't a bad thing. It's a natural part of the process. It's, it's, it, this is a living thing, as we've talked about. And so you're almost all wine cellars, almost all wines in wine cellars aged five or ten years are going to have some variation of sediment in them. And so as Ken said, before serving them, you, you put them upright. And that's why people decant their wines. If you decant a wine properly, and that's why Bordeaux uh, is this, this is a Bordeaux bottle because it's designed for that very purpose. It has a very uh, sharp. distinct, sharp shoulder. And so as you're pouring the wine out, you can watch the sediment start to come toward that shoulder and you can pour almost all the liquid out without letting that sediment catch into the neck. That's and very interesting. That's what that's about. And so decanting your wine is, is for one reason, is sediment. Also, it's uh, people open up the wine. So if they've been closed up in a bottle for a long time, if you decant it, sometimes it can be beneficial for some oxygen to get in. And that's a really good point, which is kind of a, another magical aspect of celery wine. So you take a wine that's been in a, trapped in a bottle with a very slow amount of oxygen moving past it, and it's stuck there for 10, 20, 30 years. And then you pull the cork off and you pour it into a glass. It takes a big breath. All this air comes into it. It changes in the glass. 
rapidly. Right there. And so, so sometimes we've had wines out of your cellar where we open it up, we pour the glass, we smell it like, mm. oh, huh? Sorry, you spent that 30 bucks, <laughs> you know? And then, and then we're sipping it, we're talking, and then we're like, wow, this is really good. By then, though, there's only this much left. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's a transformation that takes place, and it's, it's sort of critical to make sure that that's properly handled. When you when you work with the wine, it's different for everyone. Yeah, it's like cheese so, being you know right out of the refrigerator, as opposed to coming up to room warming them up. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. you know that brie then just tastes fantastic. Right. Whereas you you cut it hard right out of the fridge, and it's like oh, just what's this good. all about? Um, one final quick question: uh, Matt asks, would any of us be willing to help anyone set up a personal cellar? To the degree possible. Sure. Um, I, 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 the, the challenge for me in that situation, and, and different for you, I mean, I went to an expert to set up my cellar because I needed an expert in a, we're not in experts. A, I need an expert in world-class wines, somebody who knew wines from around the world. And I know our wines extremely well. I could talk about our wines, uh, how to sell our wines all day long. And as I'm sure, and I'm sure as you could too, but, um, but if we're going to start talking about French wines and, and Chilean wines and Australian wines and, I'm not an expert. I, I, That'd be fun. I go I'd to, be happy to help anybody. With sure, with sure. Anything. To the yeah, degree that, to the degree that I would, sure. I would know. I would obviously share. And then we'd have to go back. I think every year, right? And help to see decide whether we made good decisions. To see pull a couple of corks <laughs> on those that really hurt. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And just, just to see. You know, there's no, no, no money exchange. Just, you know, contribute. Just to a visit now and then. And then a visit now and then. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a reasonable exchange. That'd be fun. So uh, anybody wants to build a cellar, let us know. Yeah. We're all guys. <laughs> uh, in closing, a, a couple of things. Honestly, we have just scratched the surface. I mean, when I started oh, reading yeah. it, reading more, I mean, I already know a lot about cellaring. And then I started reading more to try and be as well informed as possible today. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a whole world of knowledge out there. Um, if, you, if you're interested, Google it. You will find that world of knowledge. It's out there. Um, but if you take anything away from this, um, if, if, you're, if you're thinking about going down this road, first of all, be really sure that it's the thing you, it's the right thing for you to do. I like your idea of the six month thing. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. And there's a lot of reasons to just not do it. So there's enough reasons for most people to just say, no, yeah, Just go to Bob's house and drink his one. Yeah, so, but, but if you decide, it's a lot of fun. It, yeah, I've had I so have much fun yeah, really having fun. wines and labeling them and knowing when, when I bought them and going down and picking a wine out and saying, I bought this 10 years ago and I knew the data on it. It's really and special. It's really it's special. Really special. And so, so if you do have the time and the money and the resources to invest a little bit into, into a cellar, uh, you won't regret it. It's a lot of fun. Do take the time to learn how to do it right. You don't want to store wines improperly. That will, it's a waste of money. You you want to you want to have a cellar that serves you well, that right. serves your drinking yeah. habits well. That, that has white wines, that has red wines, that has wines for big bold meals, wines for for a hot summer day, wines for a cold winter fire. You want to have a selection in your cellar that serves you well and serves you across a, wa a wide variety right. of opportunities. Yeah. And that's where getting good at it. And and I wouldn't even say that I'm that good at that. I'm just learning too. I mean, even in 10 years of building my cellar, I, I, I still have a lot to learn about part how to do it. Um, from my own experience with my own cellar, part of it is that organization. Yes, and that's, that's really key, important. which is something and I'm really not good at. accessible. <laughs> I have wines in my cellar uh, that I don't know about. They're, they're sitting there. I don't know what they are. The labels are gone. Well, it's just I like I, that. I gifted a bottle of surprise to somebody recently. <laughs> <laughs> No yeah, idea what it, what it is. is. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we're going to uh, we're going to sign off next week. Just to give you a heads up, we actually know what we're doing next week. Um, yeah. Next week is the club release. If you are a club member, we'll be releasing our wines on Saturday. The uh, which the means we'll be drinking all six of them. So yes, and so on Monday we're going to do a, a club I'm wine tasting. For next and I'm sad to say I am charged with the responsibility of of uh, attending the town meeting so that we can get approval That's for our garden. That's not next Sunday. Or that's next not next Monday. Monday. No, oh, no, you're missing I'm a movie night. You're not missing. You're not, no, no, no. Oh, is that? That's right. I'm going to the uh, Monday night is the select board meeting okay. for, for another purpose yeah, for our different. town. Yes. And, right. uh, we, can, but, uh, we can handle it. So I can't yeah. be here, sadly. We can drink I know you can. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're we'll going to taste the we'll club wines. the button thing mm -hmm. and, and all that. 
Yes. No well, Marika's a pro. <laughs> so. I can press the button. So thank you all for joining us today. We look forward thank to you seeing you next Monday for the uh, for the Club Wines. Uh, again, Club Wine release on Saturday. I hope you can join us. Hope you can join us next Monday for the tasting. And uh, until then, everybody have a Club great release week. Club release is Saturday. Club release is Saturday, yeah. yeah. So have a great Thanks, week, folks. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> 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 <